Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them to Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 33. Acts 4, 23 through 33. It has been a wonderful day already together in worship, and we thank God for being with us. We thank Him for His faithfulness in our lives. We thank Him for the many blessings that He gives us. Uh, a blessing in our life recently, if you hadn't heard, uh, Hannah is now expecting our second child, and so we thank God for that, and we ask for your prayers. Well, thank you. <laughs> Certainly, certainly ask for your all's prayers, just as we did with Owen, that you would remember them for health and protection, and also uh, that you would pray that our children, and God's, by God's grace, would be saved, and by His mercy, that it would be early in their lives that they'd be saved. So we appreciate your prayers for that. Also, I just have to say, today is my mom's birthday, and I love my mom very much, so I, I thank God for her. <laughs> Who wants to guess how old she is? No. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 33. I might need some safety, uh, some bodyguards later. Uh, we began last week a sermon series called Back to Basics, where we are looking again at our seven basic purposes of a church. We identify these seven basic purposes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And, of course, we find a consistent witness of these purposes throughout Scripture. But the purposes of a church are worship, Prayer, devotion to God's Word, being led by the Holy Spirit, doing ministry, having fellowship with one another, edifying one another, and evangelism, sharing the gospel. Uh, we derive our mission statement and our vision statement from these seven purposes. Our mission statement as a church is loving Jesus, telling others about Jesus, equipping people to follow Jesus. Uh, if you need an easy way to remember that, we are looking for LTE coverage in our church. Loving Jesus, telling others about Jesus, equipping people to follow Jesus. And our vision is that every single person in Central City and in the wider Muhlenberg County community would know Jesus Christ personally. Again, that mission and vision come from our seven purposes, and those seven purposes come from Scripture. And today we are talking about the second, which is prayer. Prayer. Uh, what do we as a church really need to pray for? I mean, why do we pray at all? Uh, we know that we as individuals are called to pray. We know that it's wise for us to spend time daily in prayer. But as a gathered body of believers, why pray at all? Can't we just do things? I mean, we know what to do. Uh, can't we gather together for service each week and worship? Can't we sing? Can't we read Scripture? And if we were to cut out all the prayers to save time, maybe we'd have time for more songs or for more Scripture reading or for a longer sermon, which everyone would love to hear a longer sermon. Uh, but ultimately, why do we pray at all? Why pray? Are we just going through the motions? Are we just bowing our heads and closing our eyes because we are bound and we have to do that? It's our duty. Or is there something more essential there? Why is prayer one of the seven basic purposes of a church? And why is it so essential to us as a gathered body of Christians? I want to invite you to stand with me now in honor of the reading of God's Word from Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 33. Acts 4, 23 through 33, and it says this. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage, and the peoples devise futile things? 
The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this, your word, and we thank you for this opportunity we have this morning again to come and sing your praises, to come and lift up our hearts and our voices to you. And Lord, we thank you for your word, which is perfect and authoritative for our lives. God, we pray now that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive it. We pray that you would use this time in your word to change us and to make us more like Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray that you would increase our faith, and we pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us how crucial it is that we spend time in prayer every day. Lord, I pray that you would help us to lay aside all of our burdens, all of our distractions. Help us to find our sins cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Lord, help me as the preacher not to be a distraction. God, I need your help to convey your message to your people. And I pray that you speak despite me. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you for what you are doing in our church. And we pray that you would help us to continually rely on you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Growing up, I was very blessed uh, with two parents who were excellent drivers, uh, excellent drivers. Uh, they had been around cars just about all their lives, certainly been around cars all my life. And so anytime we went somewhere, I was completely comfortable in the car. I was able to rest and relax. I was able to look around. I was never nervous about what might be happening. Uh, it didn't matter how terrible the weather situation might be or how windy the road or how aggressive perhaps some of the other drivers could be. I was always comfortable because it seemed like my parents had everything under control. Now, to contrast that, how many of you all have tried to teach a young person to drive? Raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that handle in your car, above the windows. Yeah, I never knew what those were for. I never knew what they were for until my friends and I, we started getting our license, and we started to drive, and we would ride with each other. I learned what that handle's for. That handle cannot help you. Uh, it can't give you any physical security. What that handle is for is when you see your life flashing before your eyes, you grab that handle and it tricks you into having a false sense of security. That's what that handle is for. It's the false sense of security handle. So you grab onto that and you hold on. There were many times I was riding with friends of mine and it didn't seem like they were in control of their vehicle at all. And so it was very scary. It was a time of revival because we learned to pray more during that time together as we're talking about today. But I was blessed growing up because I never had that experience growing up. My parents always had firm control of the vehicle, and I always felt comfortable. Well, I want you to notice in our passage here, where our passage is picking up, Peter and John have been arrested, and they have been released from prison. If you go back and read chapter 4 and chapter 3 of the book of Acts, what you find is that they were out preaching the gospel of Jesus. In fact, they had gone to the temple to worship, and there was a man there who had been born crippled. He had never walked a day in his life. And they encounter this man, and this man is a beggar. He's begging for alms. He's begging for charity. And Peter and John are poor men, and they come up to him, and Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but what we have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, walk. Walk. And that man leaps up. People knew him. He had never walked a day in his life. He leaped up and he began to weep and cry and to praise God. He went running into the temple, leaping and praising the Lord. And a crowd gathered around because they could not believe what they were seeing. 
And so Peter and John took the opportunity to preach the gospel. This power that has healed this man had come through Jesus, and they wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And so the Jewish religious leaders had them arrested. In fact, it was the Sanhedrin that they were brought before for a council as they were arrested overnight. The same people who had conspired against Jesus to have him put to death. And we're told that they recognized that these were unlearned and untrained men, but they were men who had been with Jesus. And so they told, him, told them, stop preaching in Jesus' name. Stop telling people that Jesus is the Savior of God coming to the world. Stop telling people that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Stop telling them that he was buried and on the third day God raised him from the dead. Stop telling people that they can be saved if they repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus. And then after warning them, the apostles were released. They're released from prison. They're threatened in verse 18 or excuse me, commanded in verse 18, threatened in verse 21, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And so now they go back to their fellow believers and they tell them what happened and they pray. They pray. Look again at verse 23. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. The church prays of one heart and one mind to the Lord and said, O oh, Lord. I want to stop right there with how they address God. Oh, Lord. That word Lord means king, ruler, sovereign, authority. That's what Lord means. This is the one who is in control of absolutely everything. And then they describe in their prayer how God is in control. Oh, Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. God is our creator. He stands outside of creation. There is nothing in this life that you will ever face that will surprise God. God has created absolutely everything. He had created these Jewish religious uh, leaders who had put the apostles into prison. God has created all things, which means God is in control. Verse 25, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, notice here, They see that this is prophesied from long ago. What was happening in their day, God already knew. This was a part of God's plan. And God spoke through David, and they proclaimed that all of Scripture here uh, is authored by the Holy Spirit. Even though David was the one writing it, it was God who was speaking. And he said, and this is from Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, Why did the Gentiles rage, and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And here we see where they apply this prophecy to what's happening then. Verse 27, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Brothers and sisters, the reason that we pray... The reason prayer is such a vital aspect of a church is because God is in control. Just like the early apostles, you and I are going to face troubles. Our church is going to come across hardships and obstacles that get into our way of trying to share our faith, of trying to proclaim the gospel to all those around us and to the remotest parts of the earth. We are going to face hard times. We're going to face challenges. We are going to face difficulties. And so we must pray because despite all of those things, God remains firmly in control. Now, we know that churches face obstacles. Some churches face a lack of resources. It might be a financial resource that they're lacking. And churches are called to step out in faith to serve the Lord. And so they have to pray to God because they don't have the resources. They have to trust God who is in control. Other times, churches need more people who are willing to put their spiritual gifts into use to serve the church. And so the church must pray that God would send more laborers into the harvest fields. Sometimes our fears hold us back. We don't want to step out in faith. It's scary, the vision that God has given us, and so we hesitate and we draw back. But we have to pray for God to give us courage, knowing that he is in control. We know that many Christians in different parts of the world face persecution and opposition. They are still today arrested. They are still today killed for their faith. They face opposition, and so we pray to God who is in control. 
In our part of the world today, as Christians, we face accusations. We face people who don't truly understand the Christian faith and the love of the Christian faith. We face accusations today of being bigoted and closed-minded and judgmental. Uh, It was easy to look around 50 years ago and see that primarily the culture in America was a very Christian culture. You could be looked down upon for not attending church 50 years ago. Now we see that beginning to switch. Today you can be looked down upon for attending church. You can be seen as a wrong-minded type person for coming to believe the claims of Christ. Likewise, our mission is to preach the gospel so that people would believe and be saved. We are going to face hardness of hearts. I was a hard-hearted person before the Lord saved me. We're going to face that as we seek to fulfill the Great Commission. And so we pray to God who is in control of those hearts. Finally, we know again that years ago, the church was the center of a community. It was the social center of a community. It was very easy to preach the gospel when everybody came to church all the time. Now, for lack of a better way of putting it, there are all kinds of activities and programs and and different clubs and things that are happening uh, that people can be a part of, things that are vying for our attention and our time. But brothers and sisters, no matter how great the obstacles may be or no matter how intimidating they might be to us, we pray because we know that God is in control. As a church, we will face trouble. We will face hardships. We will face opposition to our mission, things that will hinder our mission, but God is in control. And so we pray because the mission must go forward and the Great Commission must be fulfilled. Look at verse 29. They continue to pray, And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal. And signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. A number of years ago, I met a sister in Christ uh, who was known as a prayer warrior. She was a person of great faith. And her former youth minister, she was in college at this point, but her former youth minister bragged on her, telling a story about when she was just a youth in high school. And their church had this big outreach event that they had planned. Uh, There was something happening. I don't remember the details. It It was in North Carolina, but something happening in the community that kind of gave them a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to witness to their community. It would have been a big outside event, and so they were planning all day to be out there sharing the gospel and letting people know about Jesus and serving their community through this event. Well, lo and behold, this is why I hate outdoor events, the weather forecast began to say 100% chance of rain all day long, all day long. And the forecast never changed. All week, it was 100% chance of rain. And so as they were preparing, I think it was a Saturday event. It was in the summer. uh, Church leadership had to have discussions. They said, you know, we can still have the event even if it rains, but it might cut the event off. And it might make it to where we can't reach as many people as we intend to. It might hinder this calling that we feel God has given us. And this girl, just being a youth, a sister in Christ at this time, she said, no, God has called our church to reach these people through this ministry. And so we are going to pray, and we're going to ask God to hold the rain back. And he will. He will. So the church gathered that Saturday. They had their event all day long. It was hot, kind of like it's been here. It was hot on that day. But that day, or on that summer, that day specifically, there was an overcast. It was nice and cool. But there was not one single drop of rain. Not one drop until the last church member got in their car and then the heavens opened up, poured rain. She knew and that church came to fully understand we need God's power. And so as a church, we must pray. Here we find in this passage of Scripture the Church is praying for boldness. They're praying for confidence because what they do is they are intending to disobey the command and the threats of the Sanhedrin. Now, this is not the same as in America in 2023 if your pastor gives you some advice and you choose not to follow that advice. Not the same at all. The Sanhedrin could put you out of the community. The Sanhedrin had the authority to make it to where you could not buy or sell any goods with your fellow Jews. 
The Sanhedrin could have you arrested as they had arrested Peter and John. The Sanhedrin could have you put on trial. They could have you beaten and flogged and whipped. They could have you killed by stoning you to death by throwing large stones on you. The Sanhedrin had that kind of authority. And the early Christians decided we are going to disobey them. It's more important for us to obey God and share the gospel than it is for us to obey them and spare our own lives. So they prayed for confidence. They prayed for boldness. And likewise, they asked the Lord to extend his hand to heal, verse 30, and do signs and wonders. They wanted God. They were asking God to authenticate the power of the gospel message to validate the power that can only come in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Brothers and sisters, another reason that prayer is so essential to us as a gathered body of believers is because if we are going to do anything worth doing, we need God's power. We need His power. And therefore, we must pray. We must pray. We know that we're called to go and minister to the sick, but brothers and sisters, you and I do not have the power within us to heal. And so we pray because God has that power. If we have an outdoor event that we know we are called to do, we can't hold the rain back. But God has the power to restrain the weather. And likewise, when it comes to going and fulfilling the Great Commission, you and I cannot save even one lost soul. We can't save anybody. In fact, let me give you a little encouragement. Uh, Some of you have shared before that you're afraid to share your faith because of what someone might say in response. Someone might uh, give an opposition to your faith. They might raise a complaint against your faith, and you're afraid you won't know what to say in that moment. Let me assure you, it doesn't matter how persuasive you might be. You might be able to answer wonderfully every single objection a person has, but you still won't save that person. Only God can bring new life. Only the Holy Spirit can convict a person of sin and draw that person to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Only Jesus can call someone to be born again. Your calling is simply to go out and share the gospel. And we pray for God, who is powerful, to be at work in that person's life. There's a common expression that I have used many times in my life. I'm sure you all have used it before. I'm trying to learn not to use it, and I would encourage you all not to use it. Uh, That expression is, there's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. Folks, the reality is, no, there's not. There's no power in prayer in and of itself. Us saying things and thinking things and directing those things toward God has no power. Brothers and sisters, God is the one who is powerful. And our almighty God, by his grace, hears the prayers of his people and he answers us. God hears our prayers and in all his power he responds. He gives us an answer according to his will for all those who have been adopted as his children. So yes, we find power when we pray, but the power is not in the prayers. The power is in our almighty God who is in control. He hears the prayers of his church. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. I've shared with you all before that I was saved on March 16th, 2004. It was a Tuesday night, second night of a revival service uh, that my home church was having. Uh, I had been attending that church by God's grace for seven months at that time. Before then, I had been very opposed to the Christian faith. I've shared that with you all. Did not believe in God, wanted nothing to do with him or his church. Uh, But God had used this time, these seven months uh, that I'd been in his church by his grace, to soften my heart. And so I still couldn't believe. I wanted to, but it didn't feel like God was real. It didn't feel like he was there. I didn't seem to see any evidence that God was real or that he was present in our lives. But I saw these people, and I saw the joy and the faith that they had. I saw the hope that they had and the relationships that they had with one another, and I wanted that kind of life. I wanted the Christian life that only comes through being a part of God's church and having his Holy Spirit. 
And so I went that night to the revival, and I was saved. But here's how that happened. Leading up to that revival, the pastor had brought forth a challenge to the church. What the church didn't do, they didn't take time to plan out the worship services so that they would be just perfect for a revival. They didn't try to manufacture a very emotional setting where people might be manipulated into making a decision for Christ. They didn't try to draw on heartstrings. They didn't come up with any of that. In fact, the song service for each night was not planned. It wasn't planned. You just called out a song, and then eventually the preacher got up to preach. What the pastor did was he challenged the church to fast for three days, go without food for three days, and pray that lost souls would be saved. Now, I don't know because I wasn't counting at that point how many people were saved at that revival. But I know the Lord saved me. I know by His grace, He broke through my hard heart. We're probably going to have to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast Again Soon, because I was still back there getting ready after the baptism, and I want to sing that song at some point. Uh, but even to this day, I recognize that first stanza, Though my love is often cold. I told the boys back in the booth earlier, uh, as we were going through the rehearsal, and I got to be back here a little bit, I said, you know, if it was possible to send your way out of God's grace, I would have done it years ago. Nevertheless, by His grace, He saved me that night, and He does hold us fast. God's grace is powerful, and it is sure. Earlier this year, I preached a sermon. It was the 2023 State of the Church Address. And we were finally looking at our first all-year-long normal year since 2019. We're coming out of the barren wasteland of COVID, and we were so thankful for that. We obviously know there was a physical toll that came with COVID and still is, but far more detrimental, I think, to uh, the state of the world was the emotional and the mental and specifically the spiritual toll that came from that time. And so we were coming out of that, and I preached a sermon from 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. And it says this, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Church, at that time, we began to pray. We began to humble ourselves. I remember we had a very specific service. Brother Andrew suggested we do this. We brought in baskets, and we had anonymous sheets for you to fill out. And things that you needed God to do, you were desperate for God to do in your life, possibly just a confession of sin you needed to be delivered from, we put those in that basket, and we prayed over them as a church. We prayed over them as a staff. We trusted God to answer our prayers. I encourage you all to begin singing, become ready, come to church ready to sing and give your praises to the Lord. And I've noticed, praise the Lord, we have started singing more. We are singing more loudly. We have humbled ourselves and we've tried to turn to the Lord and call out to Him, recognizing that He will heal us. Since then, and we're still praying that He continue to do this, but since then we have seen revival in our church. For three years, we had just a few, and they were so very precious in our sight and in God's sight. We had just a few baptisms during those COVID years, but they were few and far between. I want to tell you, in this year, counting this morning, we've baptized 13 to God's glory. And since the end of February, end of February our average attendance on Sunday mornings has risen by 40 people. 40 people. Now, we're not saying that to gloat in the numbers. Rather, we recognize that every single one of those numbers is someone coming in to the presence of God and hearing the gospel message and either being saved or being encouraged in their faith. We thank God for that. God's power has made the difference in our church, which is why we want to continue to seek Him. Here in our passage, we see that the early Christians prayed and God answered their prayers. God demonstrated his power at work among them. He gave them boldness, which they needed to go out and share the gospel. He gave them unity. Because church, anytime we are doing the Lord's work, Satan wants to bring division and disunity. 
God gave them unity in the gospel. He increased their evangelism, and they powerfully proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus. And verse 33 says, Abundant grace was upon them all. Church, we pray, and it is crucial that we pray because God's power makes all the difference in our ministry. It makes all the difference. If we can do anything outside of God's power, it's probably not worth doing. If we just wanted to run a social club where we all knew each other and had fellowship, we wouldn't need to pray just for that, right? If we wanted to have a weekly variety hour where we sang and someone got up to speak and we had a good time here every single week, we wouldn't need to pray for that. If we just wanted to go out and do good deeds in the community and do community service and let everyone see what good people we were, we would still not need to pray just to do that. But brothers and sisters, if we want to be a church, a church that spreads the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. If we want to make disciples who make disciples, we need God's power at work in our lives and at work in this body, and therefore we must pray. We must pray if we're going to accomplish God's will in our church. And so I want to ask you this morning, how often and how seriously do we pray? And let me make that more personal. How often and how seriously do you pray? Do you pray daily? Do you find time that you carve out in your day because you are giving that time to the Lord? Do you pray with conviction? And belief, knowing that when you pray, your prayers are answered because of what Christ has accomplished for you. Do you come before the Lord and give Him your praises for who He is and what He has done? Do you confess your sins to Him, recognizing you need forgiveness and cleansing to live a holy life, an honorable life before Him? Do you lay your request before Him, expecting that He will answer you? And do you give Him thanks for the answers to your prayers that you find? Church, so often we are good at haphazard prayer, and we might even pray all throughout the day, but it's kind of haphazard as needs come up. But do you carve out time in your day to be with the all-powerful God of the universe who is in control of everything to pray to Him, to enjoy that privilege that you have of coming before Him? Do you take that time devotionally with the Lord, believing that He hears and answers your prayers in accordance with His will? I've mentioned to you all, I struggle to focus in my prayers. Over a year ago, I had to start a prayer journal. I had to start writing that out. And it's not something that will be handed on to somebody one day. It is not legible. But that's not the point. The point is that it helps me to focus as I daily bring my prayers before the Lord. Church, we need God's power to complete the mission that He has given us. And if you don't think that we do, if you don't think we need His power, if you don't think it's necessary that we pray, then you need to understand we are either off mission or we are failing the mission. Because church, what God has called us as His people to do can only be done in His power. To go and make disciples can only happen if God is at work. Without Him, we are powerless. And we merely continue to meet in vain. But when we go to the Lord in prayer and we trust Him and we know He hears us, God is faithful to answer. Church, we must pray. We must pray. Would you pray with me now? Almighty God, you are truly Lord. God, you are sovereign over all things. You are perfect. You are in control. You are our creator, and you are all-powerful. And God, we thank you for the privilege that we have, that though our sins had removed us far away from you, and our sins deserve eternal wrath, Lord, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sins, that anyone who would turn away from their sins and trust him, believing on him for salvation, would be saved. Lord, when you save us, we thank you that we have direct 
access to your throne of grace. And that we can come before you seeking your mercy and finding grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, we thank you for the power that comes only through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would be with us now. God, we pray that you would continue to send Holy Spirit revival here at First Baptist Church Central City. Not so that we can glory in what we've accomplished, but help us to recognize that we can accomplish nothing apart from you. Lord, you told us in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. But God, help us to be able to glory in what you have accomplished and help us to reach this community, our town, our county for Christ. Lord, this morning, if there be anyone here who has never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray in your power that you convict them of their sins, show them that they are lost and that they are headed for hell, and show them that free salvation awaits all who call upon Jesus. God, for those of us who have drifted, for those of us who have become lazy in our prayer life, who have ceased putting forth our efforts to kneel and humble ourselves before you, I pray that you would convict us and remind us this morning of the privilege we have of coming before you. And God, whatever needs are here among our brothers and sisters today, I pray that you would hear their prayers and answer them as you are faithful to do. Help us as a church to pray, knowing that we will face hardships, that Satan does want to destroy the mission, but God, that you are in control and that you are all powerful and that your power makes a difference in our lives. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.